Amen. Well, this is, of course, Mother's Day weekend, so my mother would be very upset with me if I didn't talk about her a little bit today. Uh, so I, I thought I might share a little bit of the wisdom that mothers pass along. And my mother, in particular, was well-versed in a wide range of subjects. And so, for example, the idea of weather and the effects that weather have. She would come home and walk into my room and say, you know, it looks like a tornado tore right through this room. Very smart in weather. And then she had a great grasp of logic, logical reasoning. You know, she'd tell me to clean up the room and I would ask her why. And her very logical answer was, because I said so. That's why. Very logical. And then, of course, you know, I didn't want to clean my room, so I'd make some kind of face at her, thumb my nose at her. But being a doctor, she's, she's very familiar with the human body and the, the ways that the human body can get stuck. And so she instructed me on this when I'd make that face. You know, she'd say, uh, if you keep making that face, your, your face is going to get stuck like that. It's going to be permanent. <laughs> she, uh, she taught me about anticipation as well. I wouldn't want to clean my room and I'd make that face at her and she'd tell me what that would do. And I'd sit around for hours. She'd tell me to clean my room. I wouldn't do it. Clean your room. I wouldn't do it. Until finally, she got me, taught me the great lesson of anticipation by saying, just you wait until your father gets home. <laughs> finally, a few years later, uh, she taught me the idea of justice when I was a little bit older to understand, to look back on my life as a child about everything she'd done for me. And uh, when we're looking forward to starting a family, my wife and I, she told us, you know, I hope you have children that were just like you, so you know what it's like someday. A little bit of justice there. All joking aside, mothers are a great gift from God, and they reflect, at least in part, a little bit of the love that God has for his children. They show us the compassion when they stay up long nights to help us with projects, wake up early to get us to school, to pack our lunches, to make sure everything runs smoothly. They sacrifice their time and their energy for us, and Quite often, that last slice of cake they were waiting to come home and eat, they'll give up to their child or their husband. Uh, mothers are fantastic gifts of God, so I think it's appropriate to thank God and to honor our mothers today as we, as we celebrate Mother's Day. So thank you. We're in the middle of a sermon series called Deep and Wide, and we've taken a look at the church. It focuses on the church, what the church is, why it's here, how it works, a few weeks ago, we looked at the question, what is the church? And we discovered that it's not just the building, not the facilities that we maintain, but rather a group of people, a movement of people gathered together around Christ and his word and his truth. Last week, we looked at who the church is for and that it's not for us specifically, not that we can be comfortable, not that we can come here and have our needs met, but rather that we go into the world, we as the church proclaim the truth of Christ to the world around us. And that's our purpose here. So today we take a look at how exactly we go about doing this, how we go about fulfilling the mission of the church. And this is through two ways, going deep and going wide with our faith and our ministry. And so like I said, today we're taking a look at the going deep portion, or specifically how to strengthen our faith, how to grow our faith into something that, that makes it able that we can share it with the world around us. But I think first we have to ask the question, why is that important? Why is it important that we grow our personal faith, that we strengthen our faith, that we come to more knowledge of Christ and who he is? A very wise person once posed the question to me in this way, isn't salvation somewhat like a barcode at the supermarket? So you can go to the supermarket and if you pull the barcode off a, a, a bundle of bananas and you put it on a tub of ice cream, and you take that ice cream to the checkout lane, no matter how many times they scan that barcode, it's always going to say bananas. Isn't that kind of how salvation works? I mean, we come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit works that faith in our hearts, and then we're good. It's almost as if the barcode on our souls has been changed from lost to saved. And so when we get to heaven, when we stand before God and he scans us with the divine barcode scanner, it now tells him that we're saved regardless of our faith. Isn't it a one-time thing? That's all we have to do. Can't we just live our life as we were before, now with the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of who he is and what he's done for us? Our first reading this morning actually addresses just that question. And Peter tells us that now that we've been given, <coughs> excuse me, 
this gift of faith, this gift of life, this gift of salvation, now that we know who Christ is, now that we know why he came, we've got work to do as well. He tells us that because of the gifts that God has given us, we make every effort to supplement that faith, to make it deeper, to add to it, to grow it, so that we can grow in our trust and our faith in God. And he tells us that whoever stops striving after these things, whoever stops trying to increase and grow their faith, is nearsighted, blind. They're focused on themselves. They can't see the world around them. They can't see the mission of the church. They can't see the people that need Christ. They're too focused on themselves. He concludes that segment of Scripture with the word, therefore. And I want to offer that that is probably one of the most significant words in Scripture. I had a professor in my undergrad who every time there was a therefore, he said, you got to stop and see because the therefore is there for a reason. So you got to ask what the therefore is there for. A little redundant, but we'll take it. <laughs> uh, in this case, the therefore is to summarize that we continue to grow our faith so that we don't fall away from the faith that we've been given and so that through that faith, we can help minister to others. And so how do we do this? With that faith, how do we minister to others? How do we as the church strengthen our faith in order to share that faith with the world around us? And so I'd like to offer five ways or five catalysts or five areas, however you want to look at it, five areas that we can strengthen our faith, that God works in your life to deepen your knowledge of him, to deepen your faith, and to grow your trust in him. Now, these five areas aren't inclusive. They aren't all the areas that God works, but they're a, a good summary, a good smattering, and a lot of people have put a lot of time into this, talked with a lot of people that have grown in their faith, a lot of people in the church, and these are kind of the five areas that they come up with. And so we'll look at these five today. They're up here for you, but practical teaching, private disciplines, personal ministry, providential relationships, and pivotal circumstances. Now, the first three of those are ones that we can be active in, ones that we can kind of control our response, control our engagement in, while the last two are ones that uh, more or less happen to us. We can't control when they happen. We can maybe put ourselves in positions where they can happen one way or another, but ultimately we don't have control over these things. So let's dive in. The first one, practical teaching. And now every church that I know of, that I've ever heard of, on at least Sundays has some kind of teaching. That's what's going on right now, teaching. But there's other ways. There's Bible studies, there's small groups, there's all kinds of teaching that happens in a church. But there's two kinds of teaching. And sometimes one isn't enough. The first one is simply presenting knowledge. This is what happens quite a bit in schools and universities. You present the knowledge, you learn the knowledge, you put it back on a test. That's all you need. But for us as Christians, for our faith, it's not enough to simply know the facts about Jesus. It's not enough to simply know what he did, why he came. It's not enough to have that head knowledge. There has to be something practical that comes out of that knowledge. And so we look at practical teaching. And what this means, very simply, is it's teaching that's applied to your life. Jesus was the master at practical teaching. And when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably Jesus' most famous sermon, uh, he ends on a practical note. He gives all of the head knowledge. He gives all of the commands. He explains the law of Moses. He explains all of that. But then at the very end, he says, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them and then he gives a little bit more teaching. And then he continues later on and says, anyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them. So Jesus is giving you practical teaching. He's giving you ways to apply what he's just taught to your personal life. He's teaching for life change. This is what practical teaching is. This is the goal of oftentimes we have applications in the sermon that we tell you about. We have sermon cards for you to take home to dwell on during the week. This is the goal of teaching, practical teaching within the church to change your life, to give you a way to strengthen your faith practically in your everyday life. The second way then that Christ works is through private disciplines. And I would go so far as to say that this is maybe the most important area that we'll look at today. I found that there's a, a direct correlation, at least in my personal life, between the strength and the vibrancy of my faith and how involved I am and how committed I am to my personal devotions. 
I would wager it's probably similar to a lot of pastors. It's probably similar to how it works in a lot of our lives. At some point in our faith, <coughs> we come to church, we hear a message, we understand who God is, we maybe start to apply what he says to our lives, and then we begin to pray. Sometimes this looks like the common table prayer, come Lord Jesus. Sometimes it's now I lay me down to sleep. Sometimes it's prayers like Luther's evening prayer, Luther's morning prayer. Whatever it is, we have these prayers where we, we begin to talk to God, we begin to communicate with God. We begin to open up scriptures on our own, not just in church, not just in Sunday school, but we go home, maybe wake up early in the morning, stay up late at night, spend time in his word. We begin to memorize that scripture to put it on our hearts so that it's something we can reflect on during the day, something to guide our lives during the day. These private disciplines are imp incredibly important for your personal faith. They're a time that you commune with God, a time to hear from God. We pray to him to tell him about our days. We hear from him in the words of scripture. We pay attention, pay attention to your personal life, your personal devotional life. And so I, I would challenge you then to take a look at your personal devotional life and see maybe areas that you can improve, that you can spend more time with God, that you can go deeper with God. Maybe it's praying more. Maybe it's setting aside more time to study the scriptures. Maybe it's being faithful with tithing. Maybe it's fasting and spending time with God and his word through a fast. Whatever it looks like, what are the areas that you can pay a little more attention to? I forgot my slides there. <laughs> Uh, we'll move on to the third way. The per third way is personal ministry. And this is probably the most frightening aspect of the five that we'll look at. This is a time uh, when you individually get involved in spreading the word of God. So what are the areas that God has called you to focus on in spreading the word? This could be any number of things. This could be leading a Bible study. This could be leading a small group. This could be short-term missions. This could be helping out with ushering or communion, getting involved in some way like that. There's so many ways that we can get involved in the church, but then we can also get involved outside of the church. You could do door-to-door -door evangelism if that's how you felt called. If you make relationships easily that way, maybe that's how you're being called. Maybe it's to set up a, a bowling league, maybe a softball league, maybe it's helping out with VBS, however it is. How can you get involved in the ministry of spreading God's word? Now, this is frightening because often as, as people, we don't feel we're up to snuff. We don't feel like we're the person that should be spreading the word of God in this way. We feel like, I don't know enough. I don't have enough scripture memorized. I don't have the right answers. What if someone asks me that hard question about Jesus? What if I can't give a good enough answer? But when you look at who Jesus called to spread his word and the 12 disciples, they didn't know the answers. They didn't have all the right answers. They weren't the most qualified. They weren't the teachers of the law. They weren't the scribes. But Jesus called them and he said, whatever you have, your skills, your heart, your desires, whatever you have, bring them to me. Let me work with them. Let me show you what can happen through you. This is the same thing he wants to do with all of us. Whatever your personal faults, whatever personal shortcomings, whatever doubts you have, Bring them to Jesus. Come to him with a heart for service and see how you can get involved. See how he'll use you. Use even your faults, even the ways you fall short for the glory of his church for pressing on. These last two then, these last two ways are, like I said, things that kind of more or less happen to us. We can't really control them, but they do happen to us. They happen to all of us. And now the first one is these providential relationships. What I mean by that is whenever you talk to someone about their faith life, whenever you ask them how they came to believe or how they came to grow their faith, strengthen their faith, they'll give you their life before Christ, and then they'll say something like, and then I met my wife, and then I met this one teacher, and then I got invited to church by a youth pastor, and then I met someone. And through that relationship, the Holy Spirit worked and brought them into faith. We celebrate one of those providential relationships today when we celebrate Mother's Day or this weekend and especially tomorrow. But we look at mothers, people God has placed in our lives that are very often some of the most influential people in our faith life. I know for me, my mother was instrumental in my faith as a child. I probably wouldn't be a Christian if she hadn't raised me up in the church. 
Whatever these providential relationships are, however they look, we, we can't control when they happen, but we can put ourselves in, in a place where they're more likely to happen. And so these are things like small groups or having people over to your house, just putting yourself in a place where it's not surface level relationships, but where you can go deep, where you can talk about life, where you can talk about things that are going well, things that are going wrong. And then God uses some of those relationships, turns them into something that can strengthen your faith to grow your faith. And so while we can't control these, I do encourage you to be open to those relationships. Be open to someone who can both mentor you as well as someone that you can mentor in the word. And then finally, uh, we look at pivotal circumstances. And we're all familiar with these. These happen in everyone's life. They can be good and they can be bad. This is anything from a child who loses their first pet, a teenager who gets that text from a certain someone saying they want to be just friends. It could be the loss of a job, the loss of, of a loved one. Or it could be getting married, getting a promotion, getting a new job, having a baby. Whatever these circumstances are, there's two ways that you can respond to them. And all of that depends on how you interpret what's happening in your life. And so no matter if it's good, no matter if it's bad, these circumstances can either erode your faith. You can say, how could God let this suffering happen? Or I'm doing so well, I don't need God. Or they can strengthen your faith and they can grow your faith. And you can say, God, even though this suffering is happening, I trust you that you have a better purpose, that you have a purpose for the suffering. When good things happen, we give thanks to God. We give glory to God for the good things that happen. But all of this depends on how you interpret the events. And I would offer then that how you interpret the events relies largely on the four things that we've looked at before. It relies on your personal disciplines, how much time you spend in the Word. It relies on the people that you have around you, those relationships that you have either inside the church or outside the church. But how you interpret these circumstances is what makes them, uh, is what helps strengthen and grow your faith. And so then we, we'll take a look at this uh, passage because growing your faith, deepening your faith, strengthening your faith, it, it's not easy. It takes work on our part. It doesn't just happen by sitting here and listening to a sermon. And that's what uh, Paul here is talking about in Philippians. He says, not that I've already obtained it or already have become perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which I also I was laid hold of by Jesus Christ. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And take notice of some of the action words that Paul here uses. They're not um, simple words. They're not casual words. He says he presses on. He's reaching forward press on again. These are action words. They're very intentional. They're things that you have to do. They don't happen to you. They're ways that you reach forward, that you work on strengthening your faith. And so for our take-home card, excuse me, part of strengthening this faith, uh, these verses are set on the card as well as a, an encouragement, maybe a challenge if you want to look at it that way, to wake up 15 minutes early, to go to bed 15 minutes later, and to use that time spent in prayer, spent in studying the scriptures, spent in spending time with God. This is to encourage you to develop a habit of spending time with the Lord every morning or every evening. And just see, see what happens when you spend that time with God. See what happens when you're open to what he has to tell you, when you're open to, to what he has to challenge you with. So then as we endeavor to, to grow our faith, to strengthen our faith through these practices, through whatever else might appeal to you, I pray that the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.